So um, you will see that I also have Library Carpentry app on the title. There is also a Library Carpentry organization. It's not as formalized as Software and Data Carpentry. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to um, focus on Software and Data Carpentry because those two organizations are actually run by boards, steering committees, um, have some funding associated, whereas Library Carpentry, um, I know there are library, librarians in the room as well, is more uh, informal at the moment, very, very closely affiliated and supports the same, uh, same philosophies and uh, embrace the same uh, best practices than the other two countries. Um, so thank you very much for everyone who's spoken uh, before. I think there was so much overlap between the different talks and also um, in what I'm going to be saying, you'll see some of the themes that's been coming up again and again throughout today. So, as I mentioned, there's, there's three organizations or initiatives. Software Carpentry is an organization that um, started, uh, was started by a software engineer, um, mainly because people were starting to come to him to ask him, how do I do this, how do I do that, how do I do this, how do I do that? And he realized that actually um, the questions that people were asking wasn't that hard. It wasn't like brain surgery. It was really just the simple things that would if people knew it, they would be able to help themselves. So him and a colleague um, wrote a few papers to explain the basic things um, of how to get started with computer um, program, programming, how to write a program, best practices, and that evolved into a week-long course, which then over time evolved into two-day boot camps, and now we don't use the word boot camps anymore because that sounds uh, terribly like marine and um, hardcore. So now it's just workshops. Um, but what the software carpentry workshops try to teach is um, best practices for researchers who are in the area of developing software as part of their research project. So software that will be used by other people as well. Um, data carpentry, on the other hand, was, uh, a, so software carpentry started in 1998. Data Carpentry um, was formally um, started in 2014, and Data Carpentry realizes that not all researchers are developing software that will be used by other people, but most researchers are or could be using tools like R and Python and MATLAB and others to write a script to analyze their own data with. Scripts that could be shared, but not everyone is into the, um, the world of software engineering as such. So data carpentry really has a data-centric focus, and it's all about data analysis, working with data, organizing data, cleaning data, um, sharing data, and that. And then using tools that are also taught by software and data carpentry, but to work with your data. And then library carpentry, obviously, in this new world of research that has been described today over and over again, collaborative, interdisciplinary, and whatnot, our librarians need to upskill themselves to be able to support the researchers with the kind of research that we're doing today. So library carpentry is by librarians for librarians. Um, also coding and um, you know, all kinds of very funky things, version control and whatnot, um, and a really, really fantastic bunch of people to engage with. So if you're interested in library carpentry, um, there are some links. Uh, as you can see, I've put the references on my slides as well, so you can just link to that and, and get more information. So what are these communities all about? It really consists of a lot of things. It consists of workshops. The workshops has a specific format. Um, in the workshops, they teach, teach lessons that are developed by the community. And these lessons are published under the Creative Commons license. Um, and every single person who contributes to the lessons are, um, get recognition. So for, I think if I remember correctly, the first time that the shell lessons or the, the first version of the software company lessons had 158 people on the public on the publication, uh, which was deposited in Zenodo, if I have it correctly. Um, if you and so all the lessons are in GitHub, and if you make a contribution, then obviously that's captured in GitHub, and you can be, get your acknowledgement. Um, it also has instructors. And there's an instructor training program as part of the software and data carpentry um, organizations. And that program is also a two-day workshop. 
um, the workshop focuses on using the research that is done about teaching computational skills to teach people to teach better. So the workshop is, is not about teaching people you to use the tools. The, the instructor training workshop is about how do we convey the concepts of computational work to people who traditionally didn't necessarily learn this in the undergraduate, you know, coming through their the, uh, degrees, which is actually most of our researchers. Not, I mean, not everyone comes through computer science. Um, and even in engineering and some of the hard sciences, people don't learn to program anymore. So um, most of our researchers can benefit from these workshops. And the people who um, are, act as instructors are very often people who don't come from computational backgrounds um, or computing backgrounds. They are often people who know the pain of struggling and having to learn yourself in an environment where you're not supported. And then they understand and have empathy and they can be very good instructors. Um, so, oh, and then our learners, as I said, our learners come from social sciences to engineering to mathematics. Um, our workshops typically have people from undergraduate to postgraduate and professors all in one workshop sitting around one table or sitting around one pod, cracking down on their computers and learning together. And it's a really, really not nice way for um, intergenerational learning, up mentoring, mentoring up, mentoring down, um, and you see wonderful things happening in those workshops. So all of this is governed by a code of conduct. It's a very open, inclusive community. Um, and unlike many other tech environments, this one is really open. And you, everybody who's part of the community can contribute, can help to, to maintain the openness of this community, the inclusivity of this community. Um, it's really very, very interesting experience also to see how, as the community is growing and expanding into new environments, um, how we have to adopt and adapt, adopt new things um, and adapt to un uh, as we learn about our new environments. Um, just two days ago, I was in a meeting um, where we had a, a mentoring discussion about a workshop that was run uh, recently. And the, me the person who ran the workshop was from um, Canada, and the workshop was offered in French. And we were talking about, so what kind of people did they get in the workshop, and how do, they, how do you prepare um, to teach at the right level for the people in your workshop. And what we have in Software and Data Carpentry is we have um, pre-course surveys. So before your participants come to the workshop, you can find out what their programming experience is so that you can pitch at a level that is suitable for your audience or at least can be prepared for how diverse this audience is going to be because it's often very, very diverse. Um, and this, the instructor was saying to us, actually, they can't use the pre-course surveys because their classes are all in French. And the pre-course survey, the English is, is um, so technical that it's not really, they can't really evaluate people properly with this, with this um, pre-course survey. Which means for um, non-English speaking people whose English isn't that good, the pre-course survey, the post-course survey is of no use. And the lessons are also a challenge. So what we also have is um, there are people um, in the UK and Brazil trying to translate the lessons to um, Portuguese. Um, there are people try, uh, translating it to Spanish. We've had workshops in um, Polish. Um, and obviously, as we come into Africa, at least French, Portuguese, um, what else? I don't know, maybe Arabic. Um, there's there's a few languages that we could you know bring bring the lessons in Africa, but for now it's all in English. So um, there's some initiatives, as I said, that's trying to translate the resources. So uh, about the lessons, as I said, the lessons are collaboratively developed. Um, we have we have all of us teach the same lesson on any given day. There's probably a workshop, one or more workshop running somewhere in the world. So um, and every workshop has at least two instructors teaching. So one person is teaching, one person acts as a su support person um, during the workshop and gives the instructor feedback about you're going too fast, you're going too slow, 
we can't hear you, um, nobody got that concept, can you just explain that again? So the instructor isn't standing alone, he actually has someone who can help him stay in touch with what's happening in the class in front of him. We also have helpers in the workshop um, circulating and helping with technical challenges or where um, if you have people who is really struggling and falling behind, um, instead of holding the whole class back, a helper can sit with such a person and, and help them stay, um, stay with the rest of the class. Um, so the lessons are tried and tested. And you as an instructor or any instructor, any learner, can contribute changes to the lessons. So when you're teaching stuff and you see that this actually doesn't work or the exercise isn't good or I actually know of a better way to explain this concept, you can contribute it through a pull request um, if you can use Git. If you can't use Git, you can email it um, to Software Data Carpentry and your contributions can be added to the lessons. There are lesson maintainers who um, evaluate the, the suggested change, changes. Um, and if it's a big change, they will pitch it to the community and say, we've got this change coming up, community, what do you think? And then either get adopted or adapted or um, not added with some discussion around that. Um, yeah, there's a few lessons available. Those lessons are on the websites. Um, for software carpentry, it's mainly um, the Bash shell, um, R, Python, MATLAB, version control with Git and Mercurial. There's a make lesson. Um, I think those are the ones um, for software carpentry. And then data carpentry, as I said, as it, because it focuses more on the data, those lessons are for ecology, for social sciences. There's GIS lessons. There are genomics lessons. Um, and that uses then tools like Git, Shell, R, Python, and others, plus the subject-specific tools. Um, in the lessons. Um, lesson templates, so all the lessons look the same, um, so people get used to teaching it. What's really, really nice about the workshops also, um, I can arrive the morning of the workshop and an instructor that I've never met can arrive, you know, the morning of the workshop and we can teach together because we know the lessons. The lessons are, you know, familiar. Um, yep, I've said, I've spoken about most of the rest. Um, so we also, obviously, there's typos, there are exercises without um, examples, and so sometimes we have bug barbecues or uh, as they call it something else, um, but sprints to clean up the lessons because, you know, as it evolves, there might be uh, mistakes that slip in. So we try and clean it up occasionally. So that's what our workshops look like. These photos are from a workshop that we ran in Italy. It was actually a two-week um, research data science summer school with the first four days software and data carpentry lessons. Um, so as you can see, we really, really encourage people to help each other. Um, they don't sit together. Each of them have their own laptop or, or their own workstation, um, depending on what they want. Um, and then Peter over there on the, the bottom left is um, one of the helpers circulating around the room as the instructor is talking. So oftentimes, these workshops are a real buzz. It isn't a quiet, church-like atmosphere. People are grinding through this. And um, initially, you might see you know, tears and fear and like yeah, scary faces. But, but um, OK, maybe in <laughs> But But um, by, by midday of the first day, people are generally very, very excited because they start believing that they too can actually learn these skills and use the tools that was traditionally meant for you know, the clever people or the computational people. Um, as I mentioned, we do, uh, we build better teachers. That's what we try to do. So we run instructor training workshops um, based on research. You know, so we, tr we try and um, incorporate the work that is around to make sure that we do the right thing. And we also contribute back to research. Um, we have mentorship programs. So any of our new instructors can go through mentorship programs. You're never alone. Um, last time I checked, there was over 700 um, instructors worldwide, um, really scattered, scattered across the globe, obviously concentrated in the US and UK and Australia, but um, more and more people coming to this continent and also to Brazil and other um, uh, um, developing areas. Um, I mentioned the collaborative teaching. 
Um, typically, what we also encourage instructors is to, before they participate in a workshop or before they teach at a workshop, to join an online discussion session just to hear, just to catch up. Because oftentimes, you know, you haven't taught for a year or you haven't taught uh, this lesson yet or something. Um, and you can just check into a discussion session. We have several discussion sessions every week. Um, which you can just sign up for and you can just catch up with other instructors what's happening what's the latest on this lesson does anyone have an idea this is what our class is going to look like um, any latest or greatest tips or tricks to make this workshop a success um, you can also ch check back in after your workshop and if anything specifically worked very well didn't work um, if, if you found something in the lesson that was interesting or if you want to add something and during those debriefing sessions, we also have instructors sitting in that I've never taught before just to help them see what it's going to be like, just to give them this exposure as a, a first hand and also to meet the community. Just last night, I was in a meeting where we had nine people from three continents. Um, and some people, oh, you're the person in our IT department who I always email. Like, so you get to meet your own people on this very international uh, link up. Um, and then there's mailing list, amazing ma mailing list. It's a very, very low frequency mailing list. And every single email that get, comes through that uh, mailing list is worth reading. Um, really, people thinking about the things that uh, have been discussed here, a very open science oriented um, crowd. I think also about 700 people on the contact you. Um, 700 people on the mailing list, and all of them scattered across the world think about the things that we're discussing here today. Um, oh, the last thing that we do um, as, for the instructors is we teach people to give good feedback to other people, uh, which is part of the scientific progress process, um, but also to receive criticism. So we, we make people um, tell us what did you like about today's workshop. And then what we often do is we say uh, one up, one down. So every one, one first person have to give a good comment. What did you like? What worked? What was the best thing about this workshop? And the next person I have to say, what would you like to improve about this workshop? So um, it's really hard to give criticism, especially in front of people. It's very nice to like SMS, like email something or anonymous, whatever. But it's really hard to stand up in front of, of a group of people and say, I didn't like the way that you taught shell because you didn't convey the concepts properly. But it's really useful comment to get from the class because that means I, as an instructor, can improve my teaching so that next time I'll be conveying that concept better. Um, so it's hard to give negative feedback. It's easy to give good feedback that means nothing, like it was a nice workshop. But we have to learn to give feedback that is constructive and useful so that people can improve um, or retain the good things. Um, growing community of practice, that's where instructors are located. Um, workshops have been run like all over the show in strange places, which you wouldn't expect necessarily. We've run a workshop um, last, no, two years ago, we ran a workshop in Kimberley in a wedding venue with the dates around the, the room and, you know, it was, it was quite interesting. On day one, we um, depleted the largest data bundle, so that was a bit of a problem, but um, I believe there's now other ways of getting internet to workshops. Um, communities of practice. So the steering committee, software company steering committee is selected from the community, by the community. It's not some random bunch of people. Next time you look on the website, there's a new steering committee and the band of brothers decided who was going to head up this organization. Um, there's a nomination process. You get to put out your story, why you would like to serve on the steering committee. People get, um, get to vote, and then those people are on the steering committee. Um, and really a good bunch of people. Um, there's also subcommittees where you can get involved in mentoring subcommittees. There's task groups. L um, last year we had a task group, African mentoring task group. Oh, I'm running out of breath. We, had a, um, we ran instructor training in April last year for 23 people. Um, and because we're quite a small community at the moment and people are quite isolated, I mean, there might be one person at a university and there's no support from the institution, which we've also been speaking about today. Um, I want to make sure that those people don't feel left alone. So we had some um, colleagues from the international community who volunteered to take, to walk with those people 
um, because after you've participated in the instructor training, there's three more exercises that you have to do in your own time before you can qualify. It's not a, a lot of work, but it, you still have to do it. Um, and sometimes when you go back to your own institution, suddenly it looks so daunting and you might not be able to do it or life starts happening and you never get to do it because there's another email in your inbox. So we had this um, task force who helped, who worked with our newly um, trained instructors, helped them to qualify, um, gave them some, you know, online mentoring conversations, and then those instructors taught their first workshops. Um, we wanted to bring some of them out, but what we, we didn't get to bring any of our mentoring task team out to South Africa to teach with their mentees. But what we did do was to bring other international instructors out to teach with our mentees to make sure that they get exposure to different ways of doing things. Because I think in the end, every instructor has their own way of teaching. Um, and it's good to, to see all the variations so that you can develop your own you know, personality when you're teaching. Um, mailing list and then blog posts. I think the blog posts has been a huge resource of information for myself in terms of learning what people are saying about things, what people are thinking about, um, what resources are out there, fantastic books that have been written by the community, the software data carpentry community, um, other lessons, there's a semester long uh, biology course that's been published also under, through the software carpentry um, community or the data carpentry community. And then the Twitter account, um, also very useful in terms of learning about new trends, new technologies, new tools, new resources, new learning and teaching resources. Um, so what I really also like about this community is we're constantly measuring how we're doing. Um, so when we run a workshop, typically a two-day workshop, at the um, before lunch on the first day and before break time on the first day, then again before lunch on the second day, we ask people to, you can see the, the, maybe not the color, you can't distinguish the color so nicely, but orange stickies on the one side and green stickies on the other side. So we try and use stickies to represent, um, you know, to give, uh, give the, the color to represent whether it's something that should be improved or something that's um, good. So the green one's obviously good. So we ask people to, on a green sticky, write, what did you like about this workshop? And on an orange sticky or a red sticky, what uh, would you like to improve about this lesson, about this the instructor or whatever? Um, so people get to give anonymous feedback as well. We don't always put people on the spot. Um, and then instructors can look at those stickies immediately during the break time and see, oh, people say the room is too cold. Let's turn up the air con. We don't have to hear about that in two weeks' time. We can do something about that immediately. Oh, people can't hear. Let's turn up the sound. That's not going to help if we know about that in two weeks' time. We want to know now. And sometimes people are just not comfortable to speak up when they can't hear. Or the screen isn't good. Or, you know, there's a million things that you can improve immediately if you just knew about it. So that feedback loop with the sticky notes give us immediate feedback for the things that we can change in a short time. Um, and also feedback to take back if we can give it back to software and data carpentry to improve in the bigger system. Um, but also what we do with the stickies, and I haven't mentioned that for some strange reason, is um, every person in the room have a red sticky and a green sticky. Um, and when people are getting stuck with an exercise while we're doing live coding, because the whole workshop is live coding, um, if you're getting stuck, you can just put up a red sticky on your screen and the instructor can see, oh, suddenly the whole room is red. I should slow down and I should get my helpers to help the room. Rather than someone sitting with their hand in the air like for half an hour waiting for someone to come and help them, just put your red sticky up and you can see what's happening. Also, when they're doing exercises, if you're done with the exercise, can you put your green sticky up? And what happens is you can actually see when you should proceed or when things are taking too long. There must be something that's, that you can do that's maybe explain one basic concept and everyone will suddenly get it and they can finish the exercise. So the sticky notes is a big feature of software and data carpentry workshops. Uh, I've spoken about the workshop surveys. Um, there's a lot of publications on how we're measuring. There's a new um, data carpentry um, director of assessment who's been appointed and she was just telling me last night about a few things that they're going to bring in. Long-term surveys to see people who have participated in workshops a long time ago, what, what has happened since. Um, so as I said, yeah, really trying to improve all the time. And they, have, they actually have things in place to measure. Um, loads of resources. I'm just listing lots of things there. Sometimes also funding opportunities. That one is passed. Um, 
Now, about our dear continent, what's happening here? So um, in 2014, we had no instructors, oh, one instructor. Um, in 2015, we ran instruct online instructor training. Um, five people qualified. Uh, four more, sorry, four more people qualified out of the six that participated. Um, all of those people has run, has taught several workshops. As you can see, the workshop has gone up. In 2016, we ran an, we ran another instructor training where we taught 23 people. Only 11 of them qualified. Three of them have never responded to my emails again. <laughs> Let's not ask why. No, we, we are trying to understand when do people fall, fall off. Um, those three students was an honor student to master students. And um, from what I understand from people in the environment, some, uh, one of them have moved on. Maybe they're just too young. You never know. But I mean, you know, not to say that an honor student can't be a good instructor. But um, f of the ones that have qualified, all of them have taught a workshop. And all of them are coming back to um, our follow-up event in April, one year follow-up event from the instructor training. We will do a debriefing. One of the people who is also coming to that debriefing event have not qualified. So we'll be doing a debriefing to understand what worked for them this year, how would they like to be supported, um, what didn't work, why was um, Caroline, for example, not able to qualify. It's been a year, it's, like, it's not so hard, and she's at the Northwest University where I'm at as well. So um, she's had a lot of support, but yet she hasn't qualified. So is it, does it have to do with support on her campus? Does it have to do with her personal workload? Um, you know, so we, we want to understand that as well. And then um, the, the last bar is my dream. Let's see if we can do that. So on, uh, at, at the end of April, we're running another instructor training. Um, we have 32 people selected for the instructor training event. They come from South African organizations, but they come from all over Africa. Just like our previous cohort, um, they might be based at South African organizations. Two of them were actually from Kenya, two from Namibia, and two from Zimbabwe. Um, the Kenyans and the Zimbabweans haven't qualified, and I, I can't support them properly. So we need to build their community so that they have support there. Um, so that's why I'm really glad that we have people from all over Africa here. Um, but we have people from Benin, from Cameroon, from DRC, from Zimbabwe, um, Nigeria, um, who's currently residing in South Africa, affiliated with South African organizations, but who's trained up as instructors and dream of taking the, these initiatives back to their home countries as well. We're working with um, organizations to run a workshop in Ghana, a workshop in um, Gabon, and a workshop in Mozambique, and a workshop in Kenya this year. Um, so it's spread, it's starting to spread, and any of you can get involved. It's, as I said, open, open, open. Um, so there's a Google group which you can join if you want to get information about upcoming um, opportunities, events, training. Um, I try and post, you know, if I think there's something that might be of use to the community, I try and post there. I think there's been 20 emails in the last two years, so don't worry, your inbox won't be filled up by my emails. Um, we've just launched a, a community call, and I apologize, it's called ZA but it is for Africa or for anyone. I don't care where you're from. You can join this community call if you want to know, know how to get involved, um, what to do, what are we doing, who's doing what. If you just want to listen in and see, hear what people are saying, you're more than welcome. It's a video call. Um, we try, we're going to try and run it um, the same, I think it's Thursday, last Thursday of every month. I can't remember exactly, but the dates are on that, um, that uh, etherpad. Um, it's really simple to run these workshops. Last year, I, I asked for 1.2 million rand because I wanted to roll out this grand scheme, plans and workshops and whatever, and I got 90,000 rand. And with that, I did exactly what I was going to do with the 1.2 million rand. So you can do it with or without money. Um, the community will help. Someone somewhere knows how to fund things. You know, you don't have to do a catered lunch. You can let people bring their own lunch. You, you actually just need to want to do it, and then you can do it. So get in touch if you want to run a workshop at your um, place, and let's see how we can get that um, organized. 
obviously, nothing would have happened without funding. I just heard today that we got a lot of real money to run more workshops and, and create more opportunities for people to travel between institutions and instructors to meet each, meet each other. So um, we got some money from, HE, uh, from the, the HET, the HET through the RCCP grant, the Rural, Com Rural Campus Connectivity Project 2. Um, we've got some money from Dorisa, who's, who's really been a huge partner in all of this. Um, Anwar was here earlier. Um, and the Northwest University, with whom I've been working for the last 20 months, have given me a lot of time to spend on this project. And um, for that, I'm really grateful. And then everyone else who has put some money into this, and there's more people than, than just these, but you can see that with a lot of partners, you don't need 1.2 million rand from one funder. You can actually make things happen. So I'm really grateful to all the funders. Um, and then there's loads of references. If you want to learn more about anything, you've got the references. Um, you can contact me. Do they know how to contact me? Of course. OK. So you know how to contact me. Get in touch. Let me know. Get in touch with Software Data Carpentry. You don't have to work through me. You can work with them directly. I'm not a gatekeeper. Um, but if you want to know in the South African context, you're more than welcome to, to contact me or in the African context. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you.